Thank you, Alexander, very much. Am I audible at the back? Yes. yes? Good. Thank you. It's a great pleasure and honor to be with you. You've done something wrong. Am I still audible at the back? Yes. Good. It's a great pleasure and honor to be with you this evening. What a time to be writing the time. Oh, one very time. <laughs> Yes, sir. Is that all again? Yeah. Yes, good. But I battle on until you tell me otherwise. No. Right, okay. right, let's move it up. There we are. There it is. There it is. It's just for the point, and it's actually a tour, yeah, it's a good point. Is that better? Yeah, it does. Is there one of the extraordinary times to try to write the history of one's own time as it unfolds? I'm as baffled by what's going on as anybody. So everything I say this evening will be coated with humility. Genuinely. I was having a cup of tea with a Whitehall friend of mine this week, who was a historian by training. And historians, as you know, I'm sure there are several of you in the audience who have had a historical training, like to see things in terms of questions with a capital Q. And we thought there were four questions in play at the moment, all interlocked, and it makes it very baffling to try and read them. The European question, obviously. The Irish question is reopened in a different way because of the European question. There's the UK question, will the Union of the UK hold? And there's our place in the world question. For good measure, my friend, as a diplomat, said, given the troubles in Germany of forming a government, perhaps the German question you can add as well. <laughs> so it just gave me a sense of the complexity of it all. Now, historians don't go into theories. We're not really allowed to. We leave that to social scientists. <laughs> but I do have a couple of theories, perhaps, about my training, which is essentially writing the history of Britain since 1945. And my theory really is an observation as much as anything else, that Naturally, I think we're all contemporary historians of our own country and our own time. We all want to try and make sense of it as it unfolds and set it in the context of where we've come from. It's rather like, I think the recent history books sell quite well, the history of modern Britain sell quite well, is that it's rather like going to a football match. Even if you've been there, you want to see what, whether, and the state papers the following morning, whether what you saw corresponds to what the specialist football correspondence actually happened. So I think there's a human impulse behind the appetite of contemporary history. That said, there are several warnings, health warnings. Historians must never be tempted to get into the forecast of business. And it's a, it's a sin against the Holy Ghost for us. But Mark Twain gives us a sort of let up. Mark Twain said, well, history doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. <laughs> it's about as far as you can go. But my ideal when it comes to the pursuit of contemporary British history is John Bucket, great son of Scotland, who in his 1940 memoir, Memory Hold the Door, wrote this line In the cycle to which we belong, we can only see a fraction of the curve. In the cycle to which we belong, we can only see a fraction of the curve. And I think the job of the historian is to describe the curve travel so far as best as he or she can and then leave it up to everybody else to see what they make of it. It's tough enough reconstructing the past without extrapolating from it. But there's always a terrible temptation to search for what the great French historian Fernand Brodel called the thin wisps of tomorrow that are just discernible. So if I stray this evening, particularly when we get to questions and discussion, you must forgive me. If I shall try and be as buckenout as I can. But the particular curve I'd like to trace this evening, by way of illustrating the contemporary historian's craft, is one of the questions I enlisted a moment ago. Britain's place in the world question, which has been rather tormenting us pretty well since my first conscious memories of the 1950s, particularly the Suez crisis of 1946, which is the first crisis I've had any idea about. I remember listening to Radio Newsreel on the wireless and thinking, but we don't lose wars. It was an understandable reaction from the young man, the young boy, nine years old, because a lot of us, I suppose males mainly, spent a lot of time in the cinema watching war films. We grew up to the sound of the Merlin engine, to 
to the Brits prevailing in difficult circumstances of being stoical, all of which is true, it's not really difficult. So it was a strange reaction to the Suez crisis. And from that day to this, I've read the morning newspapers with a degree of care. So Britain's place in the world question, which the Suez crisis threw up into shock relief, has always intrigued me. I remember Oliver Franks, who was a great professor of philosophy here before the war, before he was brought into war service and rose to be a permanent secretary of an extraordinary young age, describing to me that Suez was a lightning flash which illuminated a landscape that had long been in the changing for all of us. It's a very, very stark and very good image. But what an extraordinary time now to be trying to sort out our place in the world. We need where we are to know where we might be. Now, I think in my lifetime, I was born in 1947, there have been four <coughs> great geopolitical shifts in our place in the world, you from the UK perspective. The first one was happening when I actually came into the world, the chilling of the Cold War, which was freezing international relations <coughs> almost by the week in 1947. <coughs> and those of us of a certain age, and I think there were one or two in the audience as well, we were the generation that grew up under the shadow of the bar. First generation, so to do so. We were children, not of a Bronze Age and Iron Age, but of a Uranium Age. And you didn't need a degree in theoretical physics in the 50s to understand, to appreciate the surge in destructive power from the atomic bomb, which was bad enough, to the, the thermonuclear hydrogen bomb, the difference of a thousand to fifteen hundred times more destructive. So growing up in that peculiar limbo of the Cold War, the first blush of a mass consumption society, the welfare state working its way through, the health service doing great things, but we all knew from quite a young age, did we not? It could all disappear in the, in the course of a single afternoon in a great blast of heat and radiation and dust. Strange generation to grow up in. Of course, the ending of the Cold War, I think, is the greatest shared boom of our lifetimes. And it didn't end with general war, let alone nuclear exchange. I think it's still miraculous, actually. And that's the kind of booking. That's 1989 90. The other great geopolitical shift was disposing of the tropical empire, the remaining British empire, in the great rush in the 1960s. Some people think it's uh, worth looking at that as a kind of model to see a genuine, deliberate repositioning of ourselves in the world. And of course, it was done very well in many ways. There was blood stained in parts of it, to say the least. But many would argue that nothing became as, as an empire people but the night leaving of it. And there were 40 independence packages, as they would be called now, between India, Pakistan, and Burma, of course, 748, and Zimbabwe, Odisha, 1980. 40 of them. And it was a huge geopolitical shift. And, but it was by and large in the control of British ministers at the time, not entirely. And it was done with an all-party consensus, which is certainly lacking now in the current geopolitical shift. People realised it was the time to do it. And it was done with some aplomb. Some would say it wasn't finished until Hong Kong, 1997. So it was a long drawn out geopolitical shift. Largely forgotten now. It's very hard to teach young students the British Empire. To crack through the crust, you have to tell them absurd stories, you know, like the old jokes. So jokes of the, the great residual of empire. Uh, an, an, an empire, caught of the earth's service on which the sun never set, as God couldn't trust the Brits in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> The fourth great geopolitical shift before the one we're living through now, which I hope you can help me make sense of this evening, is what the Economist magazine called Brentry, rather neatly. The negotiations that succeeded, 1970-72, leading to our accession to what was known as the European Economic Community in 1973. And I've been rereading Sir Con O'Neill's official history of this. Sir Con O'Neill is the father of the great Honor O'Neill. Philosopher. And he was the lead diplomat in the negotiations that got us in. And of course, it was going with the grain, because once Pompidou and Ted Heath had struck the deal in broad terms, they were going with the grain. And Europe wanted us the nine, wanted us in. Very different from now. And the Scottish question, for example, which of course is paramount in many people's minds, is what was hardly mentioned in the official history. Mainly inshore fishing questions. I think that wouldn't diminish the inshore fishing questions. But the Scottish element, for example, in that official history of getting in was minute. 
And the legislation that got us in the European Communities Act 1972 was a pipeline bill, just like the European Withdrawal Act is. And it was a pipeline to bring in all the acute <coughs> all the objectives and the legislation that would be passed before we joined. And now, one of the great problems with the bill which Hogwarts, the House of Lords, I think, getting down to the problem, <laughs> is devolution. It's very, very vexing. There's 111 activities that have got some devolutionary element in them. There's an agreement about 80 of them that they should come straight out to the devolved parliaments and assemblies. But the remainder, there's going to be a real tussle in them, mainly because they relate to the UK internal market, <coughs> our own internal <coughs> None of that in 1972. So when we look back to that great year of getting us in, it looks like a slip compared to getting us out. Um, and I think it probably is. Though I'm not pessimistic, I'm going to cheer, try and cheer you up. I'm laying it on a bit heavy because I'm not pessimistic or anxiety. So I'm a bit more cheerful with it in the middle. The other problem we're living with the consequences of is trying to run two systems of democracy by which I mean plebiscitary democracy, referendum, and representative democracy, which we're used to, general like elections, producing constituency-based MPs, and so on. <coughs> now, the European question has so vexed us since it was first posed in its modern form in May 1950, when Jean Monnet turned up from mm -hmm. Paris with a plan for a coal and steel community, the other day, that we've had to push it outside our representative democracy system, because it's too difficult to handle. And as a result, Last June's election was, amongst other things, an attempt to bring the plebiscitary democracy outcome into the mainstream of representative democracy. It didn't work. And we're living with the consequences of that. The European question is particularly vexing for we Brits for a number of reasons. One is we didn't invent the idea of a common civic community. We largely can convince ourselves we invented NATO, which uh, we did. And when you think about General Ismay's private description of NATO, because there's the three reasons he the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. Right. <laughs> but the British way of looking at it. But the coal and steel community, always think when you're looking at an institution, whose mind was it that first conceived of it? Because it bears the imprint for a very long time, forever, really. And the coal and steel community, the precursor of the European Union, and now it's came out of the minds of clever Catholic left wing French bureaucrats. Catholic, Most Brits have got a problem with three of the five. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't actually. I don't like the French people and don't mind a bit of technocracy. But it's not invented here, Sigrid. It's always given us problems. If we invented it, it would have been so different. It would have been a tiny secretariat in an area of high employment, not many, really many people in it perhaps four letters a year to the parties of the nations. We should buy more if you're doing a bit more on free trade. Here, here, here as well, but only if you've got time. <laughs> but we didn't, did we? The other problem with the European question, we're living with it all the time now, the last comments, and today I, can't, I haven't caught up with what the foreign secretary says. I feel like we've had a day off from the foreign secretary. Traveling up on the train from the snow, much more less appealing than the city of the century. But... The, British, the structure of British politics is left-right. And the European question is not susceptible to that. Because it's a different question. It busts up parties from within, doesn't it? We used to take it in turns to have nervous breakdowns on the political Labour hasn't taken a turn since the early 1980s, which is deeply unfair. <laughs> the signs are quite promising, actually. And the Conservative parties have the successive breakdowns of recent decades. But it's not, it's not, you cannot contain it or handle it within the normal frame of left right. And so the bus stuff happen within parties, as they do indeed within families. So the European question has been sent to try it. I sometimes think that the Almighty that created these islands in a particularly good mood, gave us a wonderfully varied geology, producing stunning variations of landscape, a temperate climate, kissed by the Gulf Stream, and people inclined to tolerance, and said, all this is true, but lest you bastards get too smart, I shall give you the European question. <laughs> 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 it's extraordinary how expensive it is. Also, it has this peculiar quality. Um, Victor Rothschild, in that Ted Heath think that, used to like, uh, like a quote from Aldous Huxley, Aldous Huxley's description of life, applying to government. He said, it's routine punctuated by orgies. 
<laughs> and when you think about it, the European question when it's routine is unbelievably boring. There is nothing more tedious than juicy, except perhaps breaks the whole program or whatever it's called. Is. And that's a dead heat. And then suddenly, it makes the political weather and takes over everything. And otherwise calm and rational people behave in a very odd way with the European question. You see it every day in Hogwarts. We have to start the day in the Hogwarts world with four questions, one of which is European relationship. And all of a sudden, people have known each other for decades, and other models of civility get immensely scratchy, they get rude, they get unkind, they make a lot of noise. Then we revert to the things that we really believe in and care about, and we'll share a certain view on, like, badgers, coming on, <laughs> or um, social care for the elderly. We all come down here. And an anthropologist can have a field day watching the house of rooms on the European And when this bill comes, as you see, there's going to be lots of that. It's going to be so interesting. But anyway, all of these things are sent to our If you might have gathered from the tone of my remarks, I'm a Remainer, and I'm not one of those who thinks we should have another referendum, because what's the deal in an open society based on a parliamentary system? It's quite simple, really. It's raised voices, yes, raised fists, no. And the key to that deal is abiding by election outcomes. And even though a referenda are technically only advisory, the electorate was told in 2016 by both the governing party and the other parties that the result would be respected. And I don't think it's very dangerous to have another one, even though I'm a Remainer almost to my last <coughs> But I'm just giving you my personal view, so I'm uh, not to speak of the prejudices that I can. But there's something else going on in terms of place in the world which is not getting that much attention. It gets little bursts. It's like that lovely line in T.E. Lawrence's Seven Pillars of Wisdom, it's like the flash of the kingfisher's wings across the pool. And that's the capability review, very boring cycle, of the past of the 2015 Strategic Defence and Security Review. And the defence element has been winnowed out because the new Secretary of State, Gavin Williamson, wants, wants it to happen that way. The Prime Minister has been persuaded. This will be the 13th defence review since the war. It's very interesting when you look at the reviews that we have. I, Quite a fascinating review by industrial strategies. The one we had in last in January is the eighth since the war. The first one was underway when I came into this world in 1947. It was the Central Economic Planning Staff set up by the Africa government with its annual economic surveys. And they've all been about the same thing in the industrial strategies. Low skills base in terms of our workforce, the inability to give technical education, I don't understand why. Place it deserves in the sun. This was analysed and dissected by a parliamentary commission in the 1860s, which reported that unless we got, is it still playing up? It's. Oh, you're on this one. Right. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Good. Yeah. I'll take this one. Take this one. <coughs> unless we got technical high schools of the kind already standard in Prussia, our economic decline would be assured. 1868. So all these industrial strategies have looked at that, and our inability to fully industrialise our, our stunningly good science base, and the lack of productivity that comes from those two. How many more goes do we need? The same with defence reviews, place in the world. We slice away at little bits without ever looking at the whole spectrum, thinking what could we seriously attempt to do in the world that's sensible and rational and helpful within our means. So there's a kind of sameness about the pattern of British government over the years. But very few people are aware that we're living through this 13th century <coughs> since the war. Now, if I was drafting it, which I'm not, I would start with an assessment of the assets we still possess as a country, despite these multiple uncertainties and the multiple anxieties that go with it. Now, I think I've got, look at how many it is, 12 probably. Everybody will have a different list of the assets we still possess as a nation in terms of influence in the world. I'll be interested in hearing some of yours in a minute. Now, these are the reasons to be cheerful. <laughs> we live on top of the world's sixth largest economy. It's got a lot of sunset industries, of course it has, but everybody has. A lot of sunrises, too. And the, and the, the residue of uh, capacity in this country is very high. So the sixth largest economy. <coughs> we're a member of the permanent file of the United Nations Security Council. And because of our history, we're a member of more international organisations than any other country in the world, even though we're trying to shed one of our most important relationships at the moment. 
Underpinning this, we have a range of top flight armed forces embracing some stunning specialities, special forces, submarines, we go across the list. Remarkable range. Some are critical of this, they think that a friend of mine, Striker Maguire, who was Newsweek's man in London, thinks that we Brits strive always to be a pocket, what he called a pocket superpower, to keep little bits of top of the range equipment and trained men and women in a whole wide spectrum of specialities. But that's our industry. So I think there's something in that, but it still produces a tremendous range of armed forces that are under great pressure at the moment because of budgetary constraints. Many people think we shouldn't, but we possess a top of the range nuclear deterrent. And I was in Barrow two weeks ago seeing the steel being cut to the new fleet of submarines, the dreadnought class that will replace the vanguards from the 2030s onwards. And that since nearly 50 years now, since the spring and summer of 1969, when the Polaris boats began their continuous patrolling, the, the, de the, the, the deterrent came from the Air Force underwater and it's remained there ever since. And we've managed with just four submarines to sustain continuous at sea deterrence, which my American submarine and friends think is quite miraculous. When all else has faded in my historical memory, I shall remember always the date when it was announced that the Polaris submarines were taken out of the job. It's the 14th of June, 1969, because it was also my wedding day. You'll be pleased to hear, ladies and gentlemen, that Mrs. Hennessy and I have maintained the marital equivalent of continuous at sea deterrence. <laughs> No idea what that is, but <laughs> we have nonetheless. We have a remarkable range of very skilled and specialised intelligence agencies. And because of our alliances, the World War II Intelligence Alliance, the so called Five Eyes with the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the Two Eyes within it, which the government doesn't talk about much, which is us in the United States, we're one of only three countries with genuine global intelligence reach, the other two being Russia and United States with China coming up fast. But if we didn't have those alliances, we'd go into the second division straight away. Now, in a rotten and nasty world, that is an asset of very considerable proportions. Closely related to this theme, we have crown services, but our career services are not politicised. We have uh, an uncorruptible service. We have armed forces that are recruited to on the basis of promotion on the basis of merit, not politics. And we still have a very good top flight diplomatic service that has been hollowed out very considerably. I don't want to be too unkind to the Foreign Secretary because there's a long queue of people doing that. There's <laughs> <laughs> some way to go yet. You know. Some of you will remember George Brown, the Foreign Secretary at Harold Wilson's early days. He was a very gifted man until the sherry was in. <laughs> and uh, this, this is Boris's touchstone. This is a benchmark of Boris, not what I actually ventured to suggest it to. I gather it's true there was a diplomatic conference, a Latin American diplomatic conference in Venezuela in the 60s when George was still a foreign secretary. Long and boring day. He had a couple of sherries at the dinner dance that evening. He sees the lady in red standing lady in the corner. It's not the lady actually. He goes over, flushed with the beater. He says, Madam, I have a Majesty of the Queen's foreign secretary, George Brown. May I have the next dance? No, Mr. Brown, you may not, said the lady in red, rather acidly, for four reasons. I detest dancing. This is not a waltz, it's the Venezuelan nationality. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, in fact, a man, not a woman. <laughs> I am the Cardinal Archbishop of Caracas. <laughs> Go, isn't it? <laughs> Still on the jolly side, the best trade statistics we've got, and they are amazing, are these. They refer to our scientific and research prowess. We give the world 1.5% of its population, we produce 5% of the world's scientific papers, but 15%, 15% of the world's most cited scientific papers. Isn't that amazing? That's thinking heavier than our weight in the world. And one of the thing, few things everybody's agreed on in the great Brexit debates is that we've got to find ways of sustaining that. Mm -hmm. Because that bit of the relationship with the European Union is the bit that works best. Mm -hmm. And we've got to find ways of continuing to do that, as I'm sure you've been well aware, being in a great university city like this. 
all this and more, we have what we might call a rich barcode of soft power, cultural power. What Melvin Brown calls our cultural world service. It's not just the BBC World Service and the British Council, but they're terribly important. It's our publishing, it's our universities. It's really quite remarkable. And we have cultivated, if you might use that word, uh, beyond all measure in terms of the size of our population and the influence on the rest of the world. This sounds terribly smart, but I think it's true. I would add, because I'm a monarchist, the Queen. I think she's a singular asset. She's been a gold standard monarch. Just think, in February 1952, the first intelligence summaries which she gets every week and which she reads very carefully, would have been about Stalin, his capabilities and his intentions. It's breathtaking, isn't it? And the first cabinet papers would be provided to her by Churchill <coughs> for his weekly meeting with her. And the continuity that she's brought and the stability, I think is not talked about that much, but I think it's very real for most people. And I remember I was at some palacy type do just before Christmas, and it was one of those scratchy weeks on the European negotiation front, and it looked as if we might not even get past the first bit. And I said to the person I was having lunch with, this evening's news will be very interesting because it will all be about the tension in Brussels and the divisions in the cabinet and is it going to get any further or not. And then the second item will be the Queen receiving the aircraft carrier into the Royal Navy. And it will just be a sort of quiet reminder that there's one bit that just carries on, one bit of the constitutional works. So I think she's a great asset. And the final the one thing I would add to this list, which you may think really does push it too far, is self-irony. I think we are one of the most self-ironic peoples in the world. And I think this is a great advantage. And I remember in the 90s, I can't remember what it was, because I'm by and large on the Pollyanna end of the spectrum, actually. I'm not pessimistic usually. But something was grinding me down a bit about the country. And I was doing an interview with the great George Steiner for a radio for a documentary. And we chatted afterwards. He said, you've no right to be gloomy. If you live in six cultures and six languages, as I do, you will know that there's no phrase in any other language or culture with the potency of the English, and come off it. <laughs> and he said, as long as Britain is prepared to bring the oh, come off it to the tables of the world, you're not in vain. So I add that one as well. But one last bit, now this is very unfashionable, and you may think it's derisive, is Parliament. For all the fact that we knock it, we still care about it. The expenses scandal was dreadful in 2009. But one of the big points about it was that it showed that we all cared. We didn't just shrug our shoulders and say, well, that's the way they were, or the way they are, what do you expect? If we had done, that would have been frightful. But people got really upset about that. And I think people do care about Parliament. And in the gloomy moments, which are not very frequent for me, in addition to thinking of George Steiner's great life, I always reach for a quotation from one of the most remarkable prime ministers of the 20th century, Winston Churchill. And it's contained in the diary of a fellow Liberal MP, McCann Scott, and my friend Paul Addison, of Edinburgh University, who drew it to my attention. It's a difficult moment in the Great War, it's March 1917. And Churchill's been dining late at the House of Commons with McCann and Scott. And this is McCann and Scott's account of what happened. As we were leaving the house that night, he called me into the chamber to take a last look round. All was darkness, except for a ring of faint light all around under the gallery. <coughs> look at it, he said. Look at it. This little place is what makes the difference between us and Germany. It is in virtue of this that we shall muddle through the success, and for lack of this, Germany's brilliant efficiency leads to the final destruction. This little room is the shrine of the world's liberties. Isn't that glorious? Muddle through we shall. I have no idea how. But I did say at ten past eight on St. Valentine's Day 2018, muddle through we shall. Do tell me your thoughts. Thank you very much for having me with you.